Rose and Yolanda well played. She's got some available skills. She's going on. You, you, you sure you, you don't mind if I sign some of the back lines and, you know, give them a break? And I said, that's fine. She knew she asked for everything she got. I've titled today's sermon, and Sunday school is on if anyone wants to go. So just <laughs> young people. I've titled today's sermon that you may know, and we're starting our series on Luke chapter 1, um, well, the book of Luke, basically, and if we could get chapter 1 up there, that would be great as we, uh, we follow along. But first, I want to tell a little story. There was this pastor once, and he used to love playing golf, and he used to love going fishing, and he used to love going deer hunting. And he was just one of those all-round, you know, top blokes. <laughs> That's a joke. Anyway, um, but anyway, he, he never got out enough and he, he hadn't played golf for ages. He hadn't been fishing for ages and he hadn't been able to go and uh, hunt deer for, uh, for, for months and months and months. And then one day he decided to throw a sickie at church. He rang up the deacons. And, oh, <coughs> I'm a bit sick and I can't come into church. And um, they said, oh, that's right. You take the weekend off. We'll, we'll look after it. He said, oh, thanks very much for fulfilling in for me and uh, he he lied to his wife as well anyway he snuck out for the weekend and he went and played golf and while he's playing golf he got two hole-in-ones he was so thrilled and then he went fishing and he caught the biggest snapper that he has ever caught in his life and then he went out deer hunting and he finally shot that elusive deer and he was so thrilled and he prayed to God about it for ages. And he was just having such a wonderful weekend. And the angels turned to God in heaven and they said, Father, why did you answer his prayers? Why did you give him a hole in one, a big fish and a deer? And the Lord replied and said, simply because he'll never be able to share it with anybody. <laughs> and it's so true about great accomplishments in life. We want to share them, don't we? We want to take photos of them. We want to put them on Facebook. I tell you what, we go out deer hunting um, with, with the guys and we just find deer poo and we take photos of that <laughs> as evidence that I was close. And if the deer poo is warm, we grab it and we smell it and we'll take photos of that and go, look, look, I was so close. And if we find a tree that's got rub marks on it, we take photos of it and we come back to the camp and go, look, look, look how close I got. These things have to be recorded for the accomplishments that we make, even if they're just accomplishments of getting close to a, a deer. And uh, while we're talking about deer, did I tell you that on the weekend I came within five metres of one? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. And... Um, I was just, just walking along and I was creeping in stealth mode, super stealth mode, and I heard this noise and I looked to the left and he looked at me and no more than five metres away, we both stared at each other and he took off. Anyway, I've got no photos to prove it, therefore it didn't happen. <laughs> and we joke about that. But it's true that great accomplishments deserve to be written down. In fact, the greater the accomplishment, there are songs written about it. There are stories told, photos, statues, plays, tributes, poetry, all giving to great accomplishments. And everyone who wants their great accomplishments to be known, like Ted from the castle, we say, well, that's going straight to the pool room. We all know that quote, don't we? Some of you perhaps don't. But it's basically just a sentiment of something that's really special to us. We put it in our special room, which for many of us is the pool room. All great stories are captured in song and in written word. And church today, our Bible is our great book. And it's a great book. Why? Because it captures the accomplishments of God. And they take special place and pride and privilege in our family in fact michael today was showing me his family bible and we were trying to work out the age of it 
and we're going back and you can see the scribble on the back page and you get to the front page and you can start to see the dates of, I don't know what they were, family events or something like that, but they're 1812, 1813, 1823. And people were recording these life events in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible meant something to people back in the old days. It was front and center of their life. But it's more than just that. And if we've got Luke chapter 1, can we get the first couple of verses up? And I just want to read a little bit of this to you. And this is Luke, and he says, Since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the beginning, who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you, an orderly sequence, most excellent Theopolis, so that you may know the exact truth and the things that you have been taught. And like I said, anything that's of great accomplishment should be written down and recorded accurately for our knowledge. But more than just for our knowledge, but for our foretelling and continuing telling to our generations and our children's children. So my pop proposition today as we, as we look at, at Luke chapter 1 is simply church is for us to just spend some time and consider God's great accomplishments. Because Luke wants these two births in chapter 1, he wants these events to be placed front and centre for all of us to see forever and a day. They are worthy of Facebook. They are worthy to be taken photos of. They are worthy to be put in the pool room, so to speak. So what has God accomplished? Luke says, I want to compile an account of all the things that have been accomplished. And we hear that word and think, okay, well, what's God accomplished? And this is the whole point why the Gospels were written, so that we may know these things that were accomplished. And the whole book of Luke is a written testimony to what God has accomplished and it doesn't sound much until we start looking at it in detail and one of the first stories we see is Elizabeth and Zechariah um, uh, Zacchaeus uh, Zechariah sorry and they had been praying for a child because they were barren and the scripture and this is just a little off note for my theological friends here uh, this is just a little tidbit. Uh, it, it says that they were righteous and blameless before God in all aspects in keeping the law. Yet, ironically, she was barren and was without child. Now, this is great because we've just been studying the book of Genesis and we've seen story over story where God's promises are involved there's a barren womb and it's God is the one who brings life and fertility. And likewise, we, we, we turn up to Luke chapter 1 and the first thing we meet again is another barren woman to which it is God who is going to do the miracle front and centre. The angel would say to Mary, and behold, even your relative Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called infertile is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible for God. This is Luke wanting to tell Theophilus the importance of this birth, that nothing is impossible for God. And even Zach, oh, now I've lost his name, Zacharias, even Zacharias, in hearing this story, is struck dumb. Why? Because initially in his heart, he, he couldn't believe it. Even though he's been brought up in a religion that has told these stories over and over again of God coming and intervening 
It's a bit like the elusive deer hunting. You go out and you go out and you don't see it, you don't see it, you don't see it. God has been silent for 400 years. And then all of a sudden an angel turns up and Zechariah is just like, what the? This is amazing. God is here and he's struck dumb because he doesn't believe it. But Luke wants to record the facts so that we may believe it. And likewise, we have the story of Mary. An angel approaches and turns up to Mary one day and she's struck with fear and wondering and and, and considering what might this mean because when angels come, this is no little thing. And I get annoyed today in today's religious and and super spiritual, hyped up religious world where people talk about angels and it's like, oh yeah, 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 I saw an angel too, yeah, yeah, came and visited me in my dream and yeah, I heard the voice of God here and I heard the voice of God there. And really when you get down to it, it's just like they had a bad pizza. Or they had a dream because they were watching a zombie movie. It's not real. And when it is real, and the reason why this is so important is because it is God. And when he sends an angel, and an angel comes and talks to you, you drop down with fear and trembling. Why? Because it's real. And this is one of the hallmarks that makes it real. And in both cases, the angel said, basically be of good tiding i bring you good news and the good news was that they were going to have a son a holy child who would be called the son of god and how can this be so who here has been a virgin once (laughs) I, i i want to sort of prattle on about this because you've This is so simplistic and and, and so profound because it's so simplistic. It's just like you only get to be a virgin once. (laughs) And she was a virgin, which meant she has never been with a man. And rightly, she says, how am I to give birth? Knowing that she had never been with a man. This wasn't a question of doubt or disbelief this was a question of propriety and what is right and what is wrong and so the angel very kindly would say to to mary unlike zacchaeus who said how will this be so and the angel said right you're going to be silent because you disbelieve the difference with mary is because the question is valid the level of miraculousness the level of accomplishment The level of what we're seeing here today has never been seen in the history of mankind. That a virgin would give birth to Emmanuel, God is with us. Now we have heard this story so many times. It's almost become familiar, has it not? We sing the Christmas carols. and, And it's just like yawn. But just pause for a second and ask yourself, was this part of the gospel story? You bet it was because this is what the early church in the oral traditions taught off by heart to each other because God had just hit a hole in one. The biggest fish that we've ever seen, the biggest deer that's ever been caught, the biggest thing that God has ever done has just been promised to Mary a humble low woman of low estate what has God accomplished he has just accomplished the miraculous but it's more than just the miraculous because the God child will be the center of history the center of the universe the center of the christian faith it is going to be the center of all things and everything revolves around the sun the sun does not revolve around the planets 
so to speak. And likewise, everything in the Christian faith will centre upon us, its church, its storytellers, its preachers, its worshippers revolving around this centre that God would send his son and would be born of a virgin. And it's the songs that says it best. You know how often you can't put things in the words so you've got to break out into a song. You've all seen those movies. It's just like a movie's happening and it's just like all of a sudden the curtains open, there's a band in the background and there's a song playing. And the reason why they do that is because sometimes poetry and song and music is the only way that you can express the sheer magnitude of what is going on. And if we get to Mary's song, she breaks out into to lyrics and poetry that, that talks about that God has had regard for the humble. And then get this, and she gets into her song and, and she talks about how the proud have been scattered and the proud have been brought down and the rulers have been brought down. She sings about how those that are hungry are those are the ones that get fed. She says in her song that the rich are sent away empty-handed. She says that, that God has remembered Israel and the promises to Abraham. Now, we look at that song and we go, oh, gee, come, come on, Mary, you know, tone it down a bit. You know. <laughs> what's, what's this talk about, you know, the rule that's been brought down low? And, uh, and what are you talking about? You know, the, the hungry are getting fed and, and the rich are sent apart. I, I'm telling you, Mary's expressing in her song the very centrality of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that those that are hungry will be fed if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall, what does it say? The scripture says in John 6, it says that they shall never hunger again, nor shall they ever thirst again. Mary is singing the gospel. This is such a profound event. And then we move on to Zechariah's song. And he starts, prophetically speaking, under the utterance of the Holy Spirit. And he talks about the horn of salvation and the redemption of his people. He talks about the fulfillment of ancient prophecies. He talks about remembering the holy covenant that, that God had with his forefathers and with Abraham and the oaths that were sworn. He talks about a light in the darkness to shine the way and to guide our feet to peace. And we look at that and all of us should be going, wow, wow. Because we've just studied Genesis and we remember the oaths that God made to Abraham that every nation will be blessed through you. And now God has turned up 400 years and he says, it's happening and it's happening today. And an angel comes and speaks these words and both Zacharias and Mary capture the significance of what is going on and they break out into song. They capture it for all generations to know. This is more than just wow, I'm going to take this and put it into the pool room. This is more than just taking a photo. This is more than any of that. This is capturing the very essence of what God has accomplished. And this is just in chapter 1. The birth of John the Baptist and the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, I want to ask you something. Is this our pride and joy? When we look at these songs that Zacharias wrote and Mary wrote, do we go, yes, I love this poetry. I love this music. I'm going to pin this up and, and make a cross stitch. What do you do when you make a you cross stitch in there? you got to stick that in the pool. No, 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 no cross stitching in the pool room. Um, perhaps we'll get a big wooden plaque and burn it in for soldering iron, you know, something like that. 
and uh, the cross stitch can go into the to the um, baby's room or something. I don't know. But anyway, my point is, church, is it our pride and joy? Look at what the Lord has accomplished in the first opening round of Luke. After 400 years of silence, the angels appear, songs are sung, shepherds behold wonders in the night sky, wise men follow the star. And Luke sums it up and says, nothing is impossible for God. And even when the recipients hear it, don't believe it they shall be silent and not speak a word for what must happen will happen because if god has promised it it will come to pass even if that promise was two thousand years earlier only mary of her humble estate declares may it be done to me according to your word and this is the word that Luke is here to tell most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the truth and know it accurately. We look how it was recorded. You see, the purpose of the gospel is presented for us in this first chapter of Luke. Like John's ending where it says, these things are written down so that you may believe in Jesus Christ. Luke starts off, by declaring the very reason why he's writing this gospel. He's telling the gospel that the ministers of the word, who were the first eyewitnesses, who were the first preachers of it, had been telling the church for seriously for perhaps even a generation or so. Luke was not an eyewitness to these events. He's only repeating what he has investigated and followed all of his life. And what he sees is so important that he fulfills and thinks it's a great idea that this should be put into writing. And the written word will have two reasons. One, he says, to set out an orderly account. And how important is it for us that we have the scriptures today and we can read it and see the orderly account of things Hasn't it been great that we've studied the book of Genesis and you've learnt about the very promises that God made in the beginning? And if you were to follow the word of God continually right through the Old Testament, you would see the types and the promises and the prophecies and the, the stories of old. And it's because it's been written down as sacred scripture that Zechariah can actually get to hear the angels speak and know what it means that the horn of salvation is here because God has been faithful to his promises and to his oaths. How important is it for us to have sacred scripture, church? How important is it for us to have sacred scripture and that they be set out in an orderly account and then Luke the physician goes on and says that you may know the exact truth of what you have heard. I love Luke here. He goes, it's not enough that you know the truth. I want you to know the exact truth of how it actually happened word for word. How John the Baptist came into being. How he would be the Ezekiel of the time. How he would be the one who would shout forth, Behold the Lamb of God. He wants you to know the exact truth about the virgin birth. Why? Because who believes in virgin births? That's the whole point. You don't believe in virgin births because that's the whole point of a virgin. Virgins don't give birth. And so if someone came to you and said, hey, I had a virgin who gave a birth, what, what would you think? Yeah, <laughs> you, straight away you think, Roman soldier, or worse. And I, I know this sounds profoundly, I'm trying to push a point here, but the virgin birth is so important because it is the Son of God. 
And that's not something that can just be left to oral testimony alone. It is recorded in Scripture. The same way that we take photos to prove, here was the fish. It was this big. Luke wants to record down for most excellent Theophilus the exact details of it would happen. Why? So that when Luke is preaching, he wants his hearers to be able to know it and to have certainty in the truths of what God has accomplished. And the idea of this is captured in the sacredness of the Gospels later on and to the very authority to tell what we call orthodoxy today. Now, you may be all sitting there thinking, what are you talking about orthodoxy and, and, and what do you mean by this? And it's very simple. It's, it's not a dogma in the sense of a church rule, our canon of Scripture. It's more than that. For the Bible says that the Word of God came through angels and the response was what? What was the response when an angel turned up and spoke to you? Fear. You fell down. Why? Because something is going on that is outside of your imagination, outside of your dreams, and outside of, dare I say it, your creative ability to make a great story. This is God intervening in our lives and it brings great fear and great respect. And rightly so in Hebrews it says, for if the word spoken by angels was transgressed and the punishment was what? Death. How much more so than the word that has come through the Son, Jesus Christ? And the point I'm trying to get to is the sacredness of the gospel, the sacredness of our scripture, the sacredness of our story. Even to the point when it is met with unbelief, the angel goes, ah, 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 ah. Zechariah, you can be silent, shut up. It's just like what God has spoken is going to come to pass. And therefore the teaching of this word was sanctioned to the elders entrusted with this holy task. It's recorded that the first church that they gathered around the apostles to hear the teaching of the great doctrines and to break bread and to share fellowship. Why wasn't everybody just out there making up their own stories? Making up their, oh yeah, I met Jesus too story making up their own, oh, I had an encounter with God's story too, and, and making their own story up. Because God only came once. There was only one angel sent, and it was sent to Zacharias and to Mary. And because of that, it was recorded in Holy Scripture. Why? So people like Theophilus could believe with certainty. Great effort went into recording these songs have you ever thought about it why do we have mary's song like who recorded it have you thought about that did they have a dictaphone hang on mary hang on. we'll just do that again a sony camcord <laughs> these events were so special they were so large that people would remember them as oral traditions because of the sacredness of the event in itself. There was no room for fudging, exaggerating, twisting, or making the story more or less than what it was. And that's why the Gospel of Luke is so important because Luke would have each and every one of us know the accomplishments of what God has achieved to the point that let me put it into writing for you so you can hear Mary's song, so you can hear Zacchaeus's, uh, Zacharias' 
song forever and a day. So much of what passes for good news and the gospel today is actually, in fact, not recorded accurately or carefully investigated. Over and over again, what passes for Christianity today is just my story of what I think happened when I had a, a relationship with a God and it's just like, well, did you record it? Was it, was it that big an event? that it gets canonized into scripture forever and a day? And the answer is probably not because most of the time the conversations you have are just with yourself in the mirror. And that's why the scriptures are so important because if we're ever going to preach the gospel and the people are ever going to believe in a virgin birth and a resurrection, by golly, we've got to have more than just a gut feeling. Or more than just the testimony of Neil Little or Yolanda or, or, or Tiffany simply because they had an encounter with God. There has got to be an historical record of fact that people can say this happened and it was real. I believe another reason why the church has lost the sacredness of this event it's because we've lost the joy and the essence of what these two songs have meant. And the best way I can describe this is, is again, if, we, if I go deer hunting with my fellow comrades and we get together and we're just deer, 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 deer hunting, hunting, shooting, hunting, deer, deer hunting, and the women are like, ah, oh, shut up. I don't want to hear your deer hunting stories anymore. But we go out. And I'm still taking photos of the tree rubs. And I get back and I show them the photos of the tree rub, and they're like, oh, look how much shaving. Look how much bark is on the ground. That must have been a big stag. Now you get that, don't you? Well, let's go back 2,000 years ago. Why did they record Mary's song? Why did they record Zacchaeus' song? I'll tell you why. Because it's filled with big thoughts about a big God doing big things in people's lives. And they recorded it and they used to tell it over and over again, these stories, and no one ever got bored with them. Why? Because they were the accomplishments of God recorded in the scripture so that we may accurately know and have certainty in what we believe. The words spoken by angels were not ignored, yet if they were transgressed, there was a death penalty. And as I've said in these last days, that God has spoken to us through his Son. Yet sadly in church today, we turn to our music and to our worship and is it about the word of God is it about Jesus the word I put it to you that a lot of the music that's coming out of the church industry today is about moi number one what's happening in my life let me tell you what God's doing in my life today God's doing this for me God's doing that for me Oh, I went down the street and I prayed for a car park. And oh, miraculously, God gave me a car park in Woolworths. No, I hear stories like that. And I, 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 I shake my head in disbelief. And I say, serious? The Lord God, the most high and reverent God, who's given his son, Jesus Christ, and the thing that you want to tell me about is that you've got a car park. We should think about that for a while, about what we get excited about, what is our testimony, what we're running around telling people about. Perhaps Mary's prophecy has got some truth in it. The proud are scattered, and the humble are regarded, and the hungry are fed, 
and the rich are turned away empty-handed. Perhaps that's a warning for us not to ignore God's word and to be like Mary and humble ourselves and say, let it be according to your word. Perhaps this gospel is so practical in its description that we may know exactly the truth of what we have been taught. It's just so simple that we may know the truth of what we have been taught. And perhaps the greatest question we need to ask ourselves is, do we know these two songs off by heart? If I was to say to, to you, church, today, can someone quote Mary's song? Is there one person in this church who could do it? Was there one person who even knows what's in Mary's song? And then if I said to you, can you quote Zacharias' song? We'd all go. I can tell you some great Charles Wesley hymns. <laughs> and I can tell you some great, uh, what's a, who, who are we singing these days? Chris Tomlin, I can tell you some great Chris Tomlin songs. But can we tell the very first songs of Luke chapter 1 and the gospel that was given to us so that we might accurately know these things? And the answer is, no, we can't. And then I put it to you that perhaps we are not taking the word of God seriously like Mary and Zacharias did. What should be our response in conclusion to this written account in Luke? Well, should it be any less than the songs of praise for all that God has accomplished? Can it be anything less than that? If Mary can break out into song and as Zacharias can break out into song into what God has accomplished, then surely that is at the essence of the good news of what's going on here, that these two births mean something. That the prophet Elijah is here and that the Son of God, Emmanuel, is here, it means something. And that should be the essence of all our praise and worship today. Should it be anything less than the retelling of this account by the very first witnesses so that there can be certainty and zeal for the written word of God. But simply ask yourself, how did Luke know these songs? And the answer is, every time the gospel was preached, every time the gospel was taught, every time this wonderful event that went straight to the pool room was spoken about, they would quote these songs. They would know them off by heart. Today we have the word of God. How much of it do we know off by heart? Thank God that the gospel was so powerful, was so dynamic, that the people that it affected remembered it word perfect detail for at least two, perhaps even three generations. Where would we be if it was us? I put it to you, we'd be exactly the same because we would have just encountered a God who hit a hole in one, who just caught the biggest fish, who just shot the biggest deer that's ever happened in terms of a religious event in this world. We would be awestruck. And we should be thankful today that we have the word of God that tells us these great accomplishments that God has done for us. Church, where are we with our zeal for the Bible? I'll be honest with you, of recent days, I've not been all that crash hot. I've been more excited to quote Tim Bates. I've been more excited to be out and about showing my photos of deer poo than I have my Christian scriptures. And people ask me, well, Peter, how come you remember so much of the Bible? Like when you're doing your studies, you just it's because when I was young, I used to read it for two hours every day at high school, recess, lunchtime, recess, recess, lunchtime. The teachers used to tell me off. And then at work, it was brew time, lunchtime, brew time, brew time, lunchtime, brew time. 
I was just a Bible fanatic and it just burned into my brain and I thank God, I thank God that I read the Word of God so much back then but now I realise what's the point? You need to keep reading it and I just want to encourage everyone, read the Bible until you know it off by heart so that you may know with certainty the accomplishments of our God. Why? Because angels came and pronounced them. But more importantly, God's own Son came and spoke to us. And should it be any less then than Mary's response of acceptance? You know when God speaks? He says a word. And we've seen in Genesis what happens when you argue with God. Who wins the argument? God wins the argument every time. And does God's promises come to pass? Every time. So perhaps when we read the word of God, the first thing we should be saying all the time is, may it be done according to your word. May it be done according to your word. May it be so according to your word. And when it comes to our philosophy and our theology and our doctrine, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, may we be reading it with this attitude, may your word be done, may your word be done. And the reason why I threw that little bit in there about Zacharias and Elizabeth being righteous is because there's a lot of Christians that don't believe that God would describe people as righteous. But here he does. And it's just like, and I read stuff like that and I just go, you know what, guys? Blessed be God. Blessed be God. He said it. I didn't say it. He said it. And the attitude should simply be, okay, God's word be lifted up. Our words I mean, what more can you say? It's just like God said it. An angel said it. You want to go argue with an angel? And if God was to say to you, a virgin, that you're going to give birth, Mary's attitude is just like such humility. It's like, may it be according to me as it is your word. And likewise, should our response to the word of God be any different to Zechariah? Zacharias, who at first is encountered with disbelief and he's, he's turned into a mute. And then when they come to him and they say, what shall his name be? And they're going to say, right, John the Baptist's name is going to be Zechariah because you always call them after your father, don't you? Big tradition. Yep, always call your, your son after you. And Zacharias is going... And he writes the word, he shall be called John. And as soon as he writes that, he's free to speak again. Why? Because he's aligned himself up with the angel of the word. He's aligned himself up with God's word. He's now into obedience and he could be, speak. And should we be any different, church? When people ask, who are we? We can say, well, I'm this, well, I'm that, and I'm, I'm you, know, you know, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> At the end of the day, Paul says, you're in Christ. And that's what our answer should be, because that's what the Word of God says. And we should be saying, as your Word is spoken, so be it. And the song that we should be singing is Behold what manner of love the Father has for us that we should be called the sons of God. Why? Because Oprah told you? No. Why? Because some self-improvement, self-esteem preacher guru told you that you were worth it? No. The reason why is because the Word of God tells us. As Karl Barth would rightly say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the tells me so. 
And may all who have doubts be struck dumb and not have a voice until they can write their names in obedience to God's word, which is that we are hid in Christ. And when I look at Luke chapter 1 and I, I, I saw I, I go through it all, I, I'm, just, I am, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that Luke wanted to record it. And it's just like, thank God he did. And thank God that the apostles recorded it. And thank God that we have the scriptures. And thank God that we have it all written down for us. But how often do we turn to it to read it, to celebrate what God has accomplished i put it to you church that each and every one of us should have the bible front and center in our pool rooms it should be our number one icon so to speak not that we worship the black and white pages of it but the accomplishments of god's story should we not know these songs off by heart and the answer is, yeah, perhaps we should. And should we not know the gospel story of Christ and Christ crucified? And the answer is, yeah, perhaps we should. Because the Apostle Paul would say to his church, I make nothing known to you other than Christ and Christ crucified. Why? Because he is the Logos. He is the Word of God. And he is the thing it should fill our hearts with song. It should fill our hearts with dancing. It should fill our Facebook pages. It should be filling our Instagram pages. It should be filling our thoughts and our minds. And most importantly, it should be in our pool rooms. Amen? Amen. Thanks very much. All right, I've got to say a benediction. So... No, I'm not going to do a hymn. So I'll just say what we used to say in the Anglican Church. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen? Amen.